Today, I'm out on the streets of Ride where I'm gonna be shooting this old classic, the Nikon F3. This one's no ordinary F3, this is the F3 Limited. If you don't know about that, I'll tell you a little more as we go along. And all this stuff is online to research. There's loads of stuff on the F3. I got this camera for a stinky bargain and it's come all the way from Japan. It's absolutely mint. I don't think this camera's ever been used and it came boxed with all the certificates, etc. Even the protective covers and stuff. Um, but today I'm going to be shooting it for the very first time. I've had it for quite a while and it's just been sitting there boxed, uh, waiting for the right moment for me to go out and shoot it. Today is that day. And it does make you wonder how Japan have got all these cameras out there that have never been used or hoarded or stored somewhere. And obviously we know that Japan had millions of cameras manufactured, so no doubt there's loads sitting there. But it makes you wonder why. I can only think that possibly institutions and organisations, maybe policing, military, maybe architects or something like that, bought fleets of these sort of cameras for their staff to use. And some of them ended up boxed, stored for 30 odd years. And nowadays there's people in Japan that can go out and find these mint cameras for you. And it is limited as well, I'll tell you why. <laughs> That skateboard, can you just twist it that way and the light's coming back up? That's it, lovely. Shiny. Yeah, exactly. Lovely, guys. Cheers. Thank you very much. So Nikon already had a fantastic camera, the Nikon F2, which went, I think, from 1971. And they decided to bring out an F3. And at the time, like all camera companies do, they bring out new models all the time. So Nikon decided to bring out an F3. Uh, it didn't go down too well, I think, with some of the customers because they loved their F2. And when the Nikon F3 came out, it was all electronical, but the uh, F2 was all mechanical. So people probably thought uh, back at the day, thought to themselves, oh, I don't know about this, you know, all these electronic fancy gadgets, electronic meter, electronic shutter, I don't fancy that. Just leave me with the F2, I'm happy with this. <laughs> but the F3 become very popular and shortly after they released pretty much the same model variant, but with a different viewfinder, which they called the High Point viewfinder, which is this one here. It's got HP on the front of it. So it was a little bit higher up, and I think it had less magnification as well. It says so you can, uh, if you've got glasses or, or, or if you want to hold it back a little bit more, you can still see through the viewfinder. You don't have to push it right up to your eye. And Nikon seemed very happy with their F3 so much so that they bought out a titanium version. I think that was 1993. A pigeon nearly on me. Did you see that? Yeah, he was up there somewhere, that pigeon. Look, it's silly of me to really just stand under it. This pigeon's crapping everywhere. In, I think it was 83, they bought out a titanium version, which must have been a limited version or somewhat, probably to more expense. And then they bought out, uh, shortly after, a, another version of this camera, a whittled down version, where they took all the crap off that professional photographers, journalists and press photographers, news gathering photographers didn't need and sold it exclusively to those guys. I can't imagine that those press photographers back in the day said to Nikon, look, we need a camera that's rugged, we need a camera without all the bells and whistles on, we just want a camera that works and we love the F3, can you do us a new model? I don't think that happened, I don't know. Uh, but Nikon came out with the uh, F3P, which stood for press, so that was primarily aimed at uh, newscast photographers, journalistic photographers, um, press photographers, being a press camera. And they took away quite a few of the features of the Nikon F3, which was the self-timer. They took that away. They went, they don't need that, so they took it off. They took away the double exposure button as well. They took that away. They went, they don't need that. We would take that off as well. They took away the little lock where you pull the button and open the back. There's usually a little lock on these Nikon cameras. They took that away. So you just pull it open and the back pops out, obviously for speed. And they took a cable release away as well. So you can't put a cable release on this camera. And the reason they did that is because they weather sealed it as well for those photographers. They made it really solid weatherproofing and they put a little tiny rubber cover over the shutter exposure button. And if you feel your hand in there, there's no, you can't feel the thread. So they changed that as well. Let's see if this camera can with old sand as though I was, I don't know, reporting some, documenting something going on out in the desert. <laughs> God, blimey, sand's getting right in the eyes. Shit, it hell. Oh, bad word. Oh, shit. It's sand all over the camera already. I'm getting away from this. Too, I'm getting sandblasted. Skin's coming off. And it also raised the shutter dial as well for 
grabbing hold of it easier and also raise the exposure button as well so that's a little bit taller and they also got rid of the eyepiece cover as well you know the cameras you can sw flick the switch and the little cover comes over on the eyepiece they've done away with that there's a little tiny blanking plate there um, where that once was and they also made a titanium eyepiece as well for the Nikon F3 press which had a hot shoe on the top for them to put a flash on before that I think it was a uh, an accessory that you would put on here there's some connections here for an accessory hot shoe where you'd have your flash bit of a strange position uh, for a flash but they decided to put it on there for the press camera and they also changed the back door as well they made a special back door which uh, was suitable for one of the auto winders so when you rewound the film it rewound all the way back and left a bit of the leader out possibly for speed so those guys could whip the film out uh, and reuse those canisters another time maybe so Nikon went quite away with their F3 and I think they bought out an automatic version as well. Maybe another version, I can't think of it, but uh, the ones I know is the F3, the F3 High Point, the F3 uh, Titanium, the F3 Press, and this one as well, the F3 Limited, which they bought out in 1994, I think it was. Um, and they bought this out only for sale in Japan. And they called it limited basically it was the uh, nikon f3 press camera they changed the back to a normal back i think that's all they did was just change the back over and put it out and sold it as the limited in 1994. so this thing had a long time they must have really loved their nikon f3 hang on mate just focusing in one two gotcha i'll give that to jess and I must admit, with this camera in my hands, it does feel really comfortable. Notice I've got the bottom protector on the plate still. I don't want to get it scratched. Uh, it probably will be at some point. But it's really comfortable in the hands. I've got the Nikon FM3A and I love that camera to bits. I would say it's better than the F3 in, in regards to you don't need a battery for it. Um, that thing works electronically and mechanically as well. Uh, but as far as holding the camera, this feels heavier and it does feel a little bit more comfortable because you've got this little grip on here as well. And I think the F3 was the first time where Nikon came out with the red stripe idea and started identifying their cameras with a red stripe. They put this red stripe on the F3 and that continued through a lot of their cameras. I don't think it's around today on the mirrorless. It certainly isn't there on the FM3A. So someone in there decided to ditch the red stripe, but other cameras had little red flashes here and there on the Nikon range over the years. And whereas the F2, the F2 didn't have a meter inside the body. It was in the eyepiece itself. You had to get an eyepiece with a metering system inside. But when you look through, there was a little tiny needle that would work and give you your exposure when they bought out the F3 they put the meter in inside the camera with this little tiny tiny digital display which you can read from the viewfinder inside it magnifies it as well which tells you what aperture you're on the little mirror they've also put this fancy little tiny red button on the side of this HP viewfinder uh, which gives you a light so when you look through the uh, viewfinder at your exposure LCD and it's dark you could press the little tiny light and that comes up it is quite small it is quite tricky and the way the metering works inside you've got uh, a plus and a minus there's a little m that says you're in manual mode it goes away if you're in auto mode but there's a little plus and a minus if you're in manual mode um, and it shows you your shutter speed so you just adjust the shutter speed or the aperture until you can see a plus and a minus at the same time and that means you're bang on exposure and i guess at the time if people were changing from the nikon f2 to the f3 they might have been a little bit worried about the electronics inside especially that meter thinking oh i don't know you know we're going to start getting into all this electronic crap I think I'd rather keep my F2. <laughs> it works. Um, but boy, what a camera these F3s were. I'm looking forward to shooting this today for the very first time. One of the things I like about this camera, also with the Nikon F5 as well, you can take the prism off. Oh, my hands are so cold. Somehow, there you go. And do some real low level shots. Oh, I can't get it off, my hands are cold, I can't feel it. There it goes, put it in my pocket. So I'm right low down on the ground. I'm just looking through the ground glass. These are great for this sort of stuff. And you can see there. So I just look straight through there and take my composition. Take my shot rather. So cold, I can't even think straight. Let's get that back on. On it goes.
If you've never seen one of these before, I'll quickly go over the camera with you. It's an SLR camera at the end of the day. It takes pictures, depends what lens and film you've got on, is the quality that you're gonna get. Uh, but on the front of the camera, you've got your depth of field preview. You've also got a mirror lockup with this camera, which can be handy if you're doing long exposures or whatever. Uh, you've got your depth of field preview. Under here, you've got um, your auto exposure lock as well. So when you're in auto mode on the camera aperture priority, you can point down, keep your exposure lock on, and then get a nice exposure so the sky don't obliterate your, your exposure. Your shutter speeds goes from eight seconds to 2000. And you've also got a bulb mode but you've got a time mode as well. And if you ain't got no batteries in this thing, you can still run it. I think it's around 1 60th of a second. Um, and you can do long exposures using the time mode as well, but you can't press the button on the top. Uh, you have to use this little tiny emergency button down here where you flick it and then you pull it and then it takes the exposure for you. So that's quite a good idea, I think. And another thing I like this camera over the FM3A is with the FM3A, I think the FM as well, most of the FM range, to turn the camera on, you had to, open the lever, that would turn the metering on. If you're gonna do portraits, start sticking in your eye. With this camera, you don't need to do that. You can keep it closed, and there's your on-off switch just on the exposure button there. Red means on, blank means off, which is kind of strange, but anyway. That's how you turn the camera on and off. On the top, you've got your exposure compensation dial as well, and you've got your ISO range. I think that goes from 25, I think, all the way to 6,400. But it is a little bit fiddly, I've noticed. Getting my fingers around there, lifting it up and changing the ISO is a little bit fiddly. But, uh, you know, but you only change the ISO once when you put the film inside the camera and that's it, you leave it. You don't really touch it all the time. There's your lens release there. And on the bottom of the camera, You've got your battery slot. You've also got a slot there for the auto winder that could attach to this and burst off a firing rate uh, and your rewind button as well. You press that and you manually rewind unless you've got the, what's that? That's me mum. Hello mum, I'm just vlogging, are you all right? <laughs> so my mum wants to talk about Easter. For whatever reasons they changed the F3 uh, and conditioned it for these journalistic photographers. I don't know whether it worked to their benefit, whether they was like, hurrah, thank God for that, we haven't got a timer or a, um, a multiple exposure button, but I can't understand why I just didn't leave that stuff in. It wouldn't have really mattered, would it? You don't use it, you don't use it. But um, I don't know, I guess the weather ceiling was probably a brilliant idea and raising the shutter speed and the exposure dial a little bit higher so you can dabble with it when you're cold when your fingers are freezing cold and i'm also using a new film today which is ferrania's p33 that's relatively new on the scene ferrania are a factory out in italy they make all their own emulsions and stuff they've just released a new panchromatic black and white film called p33 uh, which was sent to me by the little british camera company i'll put a link in the description if you're interested where to get this stuff from and i'm going to shoot that as well it's the very first time i've shot that so i've got a new camera a new film see how we get on trying to compose it so you're looking through the viewfinder and you're just seeing lines coming everywhere and you're thinking that might look nice that might look nice and trying to uh, get the best composition you can people tend to walk past think you're all right weirdo what's he take the picture of but really in your mind you're just trying to imagine what it looks like on a print and try to compose it how you want it sometimes it works sometimes it don't That was the ice lows lads, let me take a picture of them uh, skateboarding. I thought that was pretty cool. I did that on the 28mm lens. Uh, and what I did, I pointed the camera down towards the ground, got the metering, which was 500 for a second, and then pointed it back up. Otherwise, it would have meters for the sky and put them really dark. Let's try the 180 lens on them. So I got back and I developed the film in Rodnoll, one part to 25, as on the data sheet of the Ferrania website. And the negatives have come out quite nice. I do feel like I need to bang a bit more contrast out of these, um, so maybe a little bit longer with the development with Rodnoll. I did a couple of tests before I developed that film. Um, but not bad, and I think it's great that these companies are coming out with new ideas, new emulsions for us film nuts to play with. You know, it's all encouraging for the film community, so I'd never knock anyone for coming out with film, no matter how good or bad it is. It's there for us to try. If you like it, you like it. If you don't, you don't. Uh, as for the Nikon F3, I thought it was absolutely fantastic to shoot. 
as are all my other cameras as well. When I go away, I usually take the FM3 with me. This has become my main camera that I take when I go away, mainly because it's small, it's light, and it does take batteries, but it works without batteries. It fires on all speeds without batteries as well. And also you can notice the, the uh, difference in designs. You've got a Nikon 501 here as well, which I think was from the late 80s or maybe early 90s, I don't know this one. And all this stuff is online to research. There's loads of stuff on the F3. And you can see the Nikon 501 here, that you know, Nikon started to come into the electronic age now and they put more bells and whistles into their cameras and the design started to change a little bit more. Uh, still got a little red flash going across here. And uh, if we go over to the the other camera, my first Nikon camera that I got, which is the F90X, a fantastic camera, still works now. I've got the motor drive on this one, so it makes it a bit heavier, but you can see this one is now molding itself towards the DSLRs of what we know today. But I don't think you can beat the classic look of these old 80s, 70s and 80s cameras, you know, Nikon, Canon, Olympus, Pentax, Minolta, that old classic look, I think they were fantastic. And they were built like bricks back then as well. And let me know in the comments, any of you guys that have got an F3, whichever variant, what do you think about it? Do you like it? Do you enjoy shooting? It is one of your favorite cameras. Let me know in the comments. If you've got the F2, let me know what you think about that camera as well. It's a fantastic camera, we all know that. And especially if any of you guys had the F2 back in the day and upgraded to the F3, and in particular, the press as well. Did you upgrade to the F3? Did you buy the press? If you bought the press, what did you, what did you buy it for? And another thing about the press I couldn't figure out was why did they leave the mirror lockup on this camera? Uh, you know, for me, mirror lockups for long exposures and stuff, maybe they left it in because uh, journalists was needed the camera to be quiet without the mirror slapping up and down. But it's not much quieter. You can hear it with the mirror, and then you can hear it with the mirror locked up. Not really much of a difference. Interesting. There he is. <laughs> he's doing well. George is. He's he's 14 now, and he lost his eye a few years ago. He had an eye removed. He can't really hear much. He can't see much, and he can't smell much. So his senses have pretty much gone, but he's well loved and uh, he does his part to run around like he does and plays with his toys like a puppy still. It's amazing how, how resilient dogs are. Uh, but for you guys uh, that have been following me for years, thanks very much. Here's George, you haven't seen him for a while on the, on the, on the, on the channel. Um, but there he is. Say bye George, thanks a lot guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video and uh, I'll catch you next time. Say bye George. <laughs>